Hi everyone. So for those who are new here, welcome to my YouTube channel. So actually this is the first channel I started back in 2020 when I was an MD General Medicine resident. And uh, the reason I've chosen this topic today is because this is the first video I uploaded in my channel back in 2020. And I've actually removed that video because there have been so many updates in NMSD over the years. And uh, today let's discuss about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. So NMSD is characterized by, as its name suggests, recurrent attacks of optic neuritis as well as myelitis. And like any other autoimmune disorder, it has a predilection to involve female patients with a sex ratio of 9 is to 1 of uh, females, females is to males. And multiple sclerosis more often affects the white population, whereas NMSD is more, of, uh, more, more, likely, is, is more likely to affect patients of Asian and African ancestry. The mean age of onset is around 40 years. It's a little bit more compared to the mean age of onset in multiple sclerosis. And 90% of the patients, it's going to be a relapsing illness. It's going to be a relapsing illness. And unlike multiple sclerosis, it's very rare to present as a progressive disease. And in 10% of cases, it can present as a monophasic illness. Remember that a monophasic illness is more likely to be seen in MOG antibody associated disease. Remember that in neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, it's more likely to be a recurrent or relapsing course. So the classical antibody that is described in NMSD is the anti-acoporin-4 antibodies. And this is highly specific and it is seen in 90% of patients. This, this acoporin-4 is located in the food processes of the astrocytes as well as the paranodal regions. And the mechanisms of immunological injury is going to be number one because of antibody mediated complement fixation. Number two, because of TH17 pro-inflammatory lymphocytes as well as interleukin-6. So what is the diagnostic criteria for NMOSD? So the name of this criteria is known as Wingerchuk criteria. So this is known as Wingerchuk criteria. So before we go into the criteria, we need to understand what are the six core clinical characteristics seen in NMOSD. So there are six core clinical characteristics. Number one is optic neuritis. Number two is acute myelitis, usually presenting as a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And then area post syndrome. So here we're going to have unexplained hiccups as well as severe nausea and vomiting. Number four is acute brainstem syndrome. Number five is symptomatic narcolepsy or acute diencephalic syndrome. And number six is symptomatic cerebral syndrome. So initially it is thought that NMOSD predominantly is going to affect the optic nerves in the spinal cord and usually does not cause brain lesions. But that is not the case. As you can see here, you can, there can be involvement of the dorsal medulla, the diencephal, and, and even the, you can have even symptomatic cerebral lesions. So what is the diagnostic criteria? So for patients who have a positive acoporin-4 antibody, just the presence of one core clinical characteristic is enough to diagnose NMOSD. So they have a positive acoporin-4 antibody, they have area post syndrome, they are diagnosed to be NMOSD. But there's a small caveat over here. So the positive test for the IgG acoporin-4 antibody should be done by the cell-based assay. Should be done by the cell-based assay. Okay, so before you deem a patient to be seropositive or seronegative NMSD, please make sure it's done in an appropriate technique that the recommended technique is cell-based assay. So some labs actually might do an ELISA. So please don't interpret as seropositive or seronegative based only on ELISA. When the patient comes to the reports, please make sure it's done by the cell-based assay. And number three, there should be exclusion of alternative diagnosis. So it's very simple. Patient should be seropositive by cell-based assay. Just one core clinical characteristic is enough. And there should be exclusion of alternative diagnosis. So this is about the criteria for NMOSD. So now let's discuss about the different uh, sites of involvement or patterns of involvement for NMOSD. So we'll talk about the optic nerve involvement, the spinal cord involvement, and finally we'll talk about the brain involvement. So coming to the optic nerve involvement, it tends to be bilateral. It causes severe vision loss can cause quite severe vision loss and it has a predilection to involve the posterior optic pathway. So it has a predilection to involve the optic chiasm as well as the optic tracts. And because of this, you're not going to see any sort of papillitis or any optic disc edema. The fundoscopy in most of the cases is going to be normal and there's going to be less orbital pain and this has poor visual outcomes. So if you look at this image over here, you can see that NMSD has a predilection to involve the optic chiasm. It has a predilection to involve the optic chiasm and you can see this is an MRA brain T1 post gadolinium contrast images and you can see that there is enhancement you can see that there is enhancement of the optic chiasm 
So just to summarize, it's bilateral, it's severe, severe vision loss, predominantly chiasm and optic tract involvement, visual outcomes are quite poor and less periorbital pain. Now coming to the spinal cord involvement. So the patient is going to present with longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, that is involvement of three or more contiguous segments. Three or more contiguous vertebral segments. And the site of the cord involvement is predominantly cervical and upper thoracic cord involvement. And it tends to involve the entire cross-sectional area of the cord. So both the white matter, gray matter, the entire axial section of the cord is cross-sectional area of the cord is going to get involved. And it's associated with cord swelling and edema. And sometimes it can be quite confusing to differentiate an NMOSD transverse myelitis from a intraaxial spinal cord neoplasm. And another classical sign which you'll see now is the bright spotty lesions. And there's going to be a peripheral pattern of enhancement. So let's have a look at this image over here. So the first image is a representation, schematic representation of the T2 sagittal. So you can see there is a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. There is a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. Definitely there is more of three segments involved. It's predominantly involving the cervical cord as well as the upper thoracic cord. So predominantly cervical thoracic involvement. And in the axial sections, you can see that the major majority of the area of the cross section area is involved. And if you look at the contrast images, if you look at the contrast images, there is a very fine peripheral enhancement. So if you take the transverse myelitis, it's predominantly a, in the gadolinium images, it's going to be a peripheral enhancement. And on the right side, you can see the actual MRI images. So in the T2 images, you can see that there is a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And next to this, you can see in, in addition, within the lesion, you can see there is actually a T2 hyperintense lesion. There is a T2 hyperintense lesion within the myelitis. And this is known as the bright spotty lesions. This is known as the bright spotty lesions and is, is quite a characteristic neuroradiological sign for NMOSD related myelitis. And the second image you can see, this is, these are the contrast images. And there is a peripheral enhancement. There is a peripheral enhancement which is seen over here. Yes. So next coming to the brain involvement. So the first four images, the first four images are actually T2 flare. The last image is actually a, the last image is actually a gadolinium or contrast imaging. So the classical areas of involvement that is seen in NMS2, here you can see this is actually a cross section at the level of the medulla. This is a cross section at the level of the medulla. And you can see there is a involvement of the dorsal medulla. There is an involvement of the dorsal medulla. This is nothing but the area postima. So this patient has an area postima syndrome. Now we'll have a look at the third image. You can also see that there can be involvement of the corticospinal tracts, especially at the level of the internal capsule, especially at the level of the internal capsule. And over here, you can see that there is involvement of the splenium. There's involvement of the splenium of the corpus callosum. And this sign is known as the arch bridge sign. This is known as the arch bridge sign. So involvement of the splenium of the corpus callosum in NMST patients is known as the arch bridge sign. And you can also have non-specific small, small T2 flare hyperintensity scattered over the supratentorial region. And in the contrast, or there's the gadolinium, uh, gadolinium enhancement pattern, there is a pencil-like fine enhancement of the periventricular region. So there'll be pencil-like fine enhancement of the periventricular region. Okay, so this is known as periependymal pencil thin enhancement. So just to summarize, you can get area postima syndrome, corticospinal tract involvement in the internal capsule, splenium of corpus callosum can be involved. This is known as the arch bridge sign. You can have non-specific small, small T2 flare hyperintensities over the cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex white matter. And you can have a classical pencil thin enhancement, periependymal pattern of pencil thin enhancement in the periventricular region. So now coming to the investigation. So now we have read about the different patterns of involvement. So obviously we're going to do an MRI. Other investigations regarding the CSF analysis, oligoclonal bands is not as common as an MS. It's usually seen in only less than 20% of cases. And the pleocytosis, that is the amount of cells in the CSF is significantly more compared to what is that seen in multiple sclerosis. So sometimes it can be quite marked, even up to more than 50 cells can be seen. And even the populations of cells tends to be more of neutrophils as well as eosinophils. And the other investigation, please don't forget, IgG, acoporin-4 antibodies, very specific 
seen in 90 percentage of patients with the classical NMOST syndrome and it should be done by cell based assay so i'm repeating this point many times please make sure it's done by cell based assay so NMST is associated with other systemic autoimmune disorders in 40 percentage of cases so it's always vital that we also screen for these so diseases like sle jogren syndrome anka vasculitis myasthenia gravis hashimoto's thyroiditis mixed country tissue disorders so around 40 percentage of your NMST patients can have an associated systemic autoimmunity so it's vital that we do screen for these and it's rarely associated with uh, as a, it can rarely present as a parainfectious uh, parainfectious uh, pathology but remember that it's usually mogad it is mog antibody associated disease that presents as a parainfectious or para vaccination phenomenon it's very rare or quite uh, unlikely for an NMST to present like that but there have been reports of varicella e epstein barr virus hiv and tuberculosis being associated with NMST and very rarely it can be a paraneoplastic phenomenon secondary to a breast or lung carcinoma so how do you treat a patient with neuromyelitis optica so the treatment will split it into acute attacks as well as preventing further attacks so coming to the acute attacks we're going to treat them with either steroids or plasma exchange so when it comes to steroids we'll have to give injection methylprednisolone one gram per day which is given over five to seven days followed by oral steroids at a dose of one milligram per kilogram so usually we continue oral steroids that is prednisolone at a dose of one milligram per kilogram but please don't taper it rapidly as you do for multiple sclerosis here we'll have to continue this full dose of prednisolone that is one mg per kg up to even 12 weeks okay up to a few weeks to 12 weeks depending on the clinical response it's only after that that you're going to start to taper so don't taper it soon within two weeks like you do for multiple sclerosis pulse the patient continue oral steroids at full dose for at least maybe around six to 12 weeks and consider tapering after that based on the clinical response and please have a low threshold to start plasma exchange if the patient is not responding to steroids within the first one or two days it's better to go or plan for plasma exchange in a parallel fashion usually we do around five to seven exchanges of 1.5 plasma volumes per exchange so this is about the acute treatment of NMST. so it's mainly it mainly revolves around steroids and plasma exchange but remember if these two are not working you might have to try ivh but these two are the main treatment modalities for an acute attack now coming to preventing further attacks so as i mentioned nmsd is a relapsing is a relapsing or recurrent illness so definitely we'll have to prevent further attacks from happening so we have off-label drugs as well as fda approved drugs so first coming to the off-label drugs that can be used mycophenolate mofetil rituximab and azathioprine so rituximab is one of the most commonly used drugs so how we give rituximab usually is first we give an induction we give an induction therapy with two grams usually we give one gram first and around two weeks later we give another one gram and after this we give one gram iv every six months every six months but remember that before you give the next dose after six months you have to check for the cd19 levels only if the CD19 levels is more than 1%, you have to go for the next dose. In case the CD19 levels are still suppressed or it is less than 1%, you'll have to repeat it after 2 to 3 months before going for the next dose of rituximab. So this is regarding the off-label management. But remember that there are four approved drugs for NMSD for prophylaxis. So let's go into that. So the first drug, the first drug that was FDA approved for NMSD is eculizumab. This is an anti-C5 complement. Initially, it's given at 900 milligrams per week for the first four weeks. After week on week five, we increase the dose to 1,200 milligrams. And after this, we continue 1,200 milligrams every two weeks. The issue with eclizumab is it puts the patient at a significant risk of life-threatening and fatal meningococcal infections. So always make sure that you vaccinate the patient with meningococcal vaccine at least two weeks prior to the first dose. Next, coming to inabilizumab, this is an anti-CD19 agent, okay? So remember, rituximab is off-label, it's CD, anti-CD20. Inabilizumab is approved and it is an anti-CD19 agent. It's given us 300 milligrams IV. Two weeks later, we give another 300 milligrams. After that, we give 300 milligrams IV every six months. The third drug is satralizumab. This is an anti-interleukin-6 receptor. So if you remember the pathogenesis, I mentioned that interleukin-6 is one of the important uh, causes for the pathogenesis of NMST. So, satralizumab is an anti interleukin 6 receptor antibody. It's given initially at a loading dose of 120 milligrams subcutaneously on weeks 0, 2, and 4. After this, we have to give 120 milligrams subcutaneously every four weeks. And the most recently approved drug for 
for from the from FDA for NMOSD is rabulizumab. This also like eculizumab is an anti C5 agent, but the advantage is you don't need to give the dosing quite frequently. So as you remember, in eculizumab you have to give it once every two weeks, but because of the longer duration of action of uh, action of rabulizumab, it only needs to be given once in eight weeks. So this is about the treatment of NMOSD. So I think in the next class we'll try to cover about MOG antibody associated disease. Thank you.